everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out to either our 930 or 1130 service on Sunday. But if you can't, you can always watch us online here at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can look up any past messages, see any of our upcoming events, and read pastors' blogs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media right here. And now, here's this week's message. It's an absolute delight to come and serve the Destiny family. Uh, last year, I traveled with Tim. This year, I'm with Nathan. Nathan's my uh, PA. Uh, Tim said to Nathan last week, oh, you're going to go to Destiny. They love Steve more than we do. <laughs> he said it feels like it. He's received with so much love when he goes there. And I feel that way. I feel the love of the family here. And uh, it, it really is a sign of the kingdom we belong to, that our hearts knit, not because of our hobbies and not because we had a similar upbringing, but simply being found in Christ, finding other Christ followers, and then the joining that the Holy Spirit brings into our life is perhaps one of the most rewarding things on this earth to find other family members and have the Holy Spirit connect your hearts. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to come and serve you as a church family. And I, I think Lawrence, I, when he was talking about me, I'm like, who is that man he's talking about? Because it isn't me. Uh, you know, I, I still see myself as a little Indian boy, just in love with Jesus, trying to serve him the best that I can. And uh, whatever anybody else thinks about me, that's up to them. I feel like I'm just trying to figure my way out on this journey with Jesus and really enjoying the journey of knowing him and working and walking with him each and every day. And so Pastor Lawrence and Tracy, I'm honored to be able to serve you. Uh, they, they've both, both been a great voice to us. We were in America last August and they were over in the UK and kind of spoke for me while I was over, I think I was, I can't remember where I was, I was on the West Coast. And uh, so really appreciated you being with us. And they're with us twice this year. At the beginning of June with the group of our leaders and ministering in the church. And then coming back, I didn't ask him properly because I wanted to ask him face to face. Would you come and uh, uh, officiate uh, the wedding for Beth? Because um, I can't really officiate it and give her away and everything else. And she'd asked, I would love it if Pastor Lawrence could do it. So I asked him a couple of days ago and I was so excited that... Uh, you as a church are willing to release him, considering he would have been with us about two weeks earlier, just the way all the dates worked out. So uh, we're really excited for the connection, for the sense of family. And I do believe that for yourselves, this is the kind of a, a, a fresh wave of what God wants to do. Yeah. At the end of yesterday, just a real clear sense of roots going deeper, the tree going higher, influence extending out. Uh, I feel Pastor Lawrence and, and thereby you as a church have had an influence wider than just your own community, you know, wh whether it's in the nation in different churches, over in the UK, uh, Lawrence is loved in many parts of the UK, but I felt the Lord is going to extend your influence in your own city in a greater way. And I think that will happen both by the growth of the community, the family here, but you'll see it in the way that you can serve other churches in the city. I, I believe it's the, it's the attitude I carry. I know Lawrence has this. We look for ways to serve the body of Christ so that we can all become better in who God wants us to be. And so I try and do that in Wolverhampton. Uh, I, 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 many of the ministers are really good friends of mine, and we look for ways to serve the church in the city. Uh, in fact, this morning, one of the other ministers in the city was preaching for me back home, and uh, I'm preaching for him in a few months' time. But exchanging pulpits, giving into each other's building offerings, honoring and serving one that we do that all the time in Wolverhampton. It's a crazy way of doing kingdom. I don't know if that's normal in America. It's not always normal in, in, in England either. But I, I tell you, two years ago, I don't mean to get distracted, but two years ago, three years ago, we're in the middle of a building project and uh, the local Baptist minister showed up at one of our staff meetings with a check for 10,000, I think it was, 10,000 pounds. It may have been 20, I can't remember. 10 or 20,000 pounds said, this is from us to you for your building fund. That's crazy. 
Uh, I, I just think, wow, uh, there's something very powerful. A few years, a couple of years before that, we had done the same for another church nearby that we're building, and we were able to take two Sunday offerings, put it together, and go and give it to them. And they're not in our denomination, they're not part of our stream. I hadn't even seen the pastor in 18 months. I just heard they were building and thought it would be really cool if we could help them. I think that's kingdom. Uh, there's been a, I could tell you lots of stories like that in our city, kind of just serving. And I, I, so I sense as destiny, you're going to be servants of the church in Oklahoma, but you'll find in doing it that God will bless you because you're looking after his body, not just yourself. Amen. So, Father, I thank you for this moment we've just kind of shared, and I, I feel highly honored and privileged to be part of the church family here and to be able to serve them. And I pray that even from today, there'd be a turning point in terms of the fruitfulness and the influence upon them as a church family. I pray that they would see the city turning their head and their eyes towards what you're doing here. I pray that the posture of this church would be one that says we want to serve the city in which the Lord has placed us, both the Christian community and those who don't yet know Christ. This church would live to serve both of those. I thank you that when they do that faithfully, you will bless them because he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And when we're faithful in little, we're entrusted with much. And so I pray a blessing upon this house, upon Pastor Lawrence and Tracy as they lead the work here in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I want to speak to you for a few moments. Uh, uh, the title is really simple. It's, I've titled it Becoming Mighty on the Inside. Uh, I want to help you to know how you can get strong on the inside. Let me give you a couple of examples of where I'm going with this. Uh, you've heard of David in the Bible, the story of David and Goliath. I, I kind of think about that in 1 Samuel 17. You have David who uh, is probably around about 16, 17 years old. So he's not very old. He's a shepherd boy. He really has no leadership experience. He's got no warfare experience. And his dad says to him, to go and take food for the brothers who are on the front line of a battle. David shows up at the battle, and he has to face Goliath. He doesn't have to, but he hears the cry that Goliath makes. So picture this. You've got the Israelites on one side. You've got the Philistines on the other side. And every day, there's one man from the Philistine army has stepped out, thrown out a challenge to all of the Israelites saying, hey, instead of both of our armies fighting, just send one man to fight me. The only problem is Goliath is about 9 to 11 feet tall. He's been trained in warfare since he was a boy. I mean, he's just a monster of a man who's really into violence and blood and loves killing people. And all of these soldiers, every time they see Goliath... They turn around and run. I mean, that's it's, it's not very cool for an army to be running away. But he is very, very intimidating. So 40 days into that story, he comes out every morning, every night. They line up for battle every day. They stomp. They bang their spears, clap their shields together with the spears. And then when he says his little piece, they run away again. Isn't that a crazy, crazy little picture? It was happening. It's a true story. So 40 days in, David shows up, 16, 17-year-old shepherd boy, and he turns up at the time that Goliath is making his daily kind of challenge. And David's response is, what will be done for the person who kills this Philistine? I'm like, are you serious? Everybody else is running away. And you're asking, what's the reward if I take him down? So I ask myself the question, what kind of person asks a question like that? Are you with me? Yeah. When most people are running away, when most people are scared, how does a 16, 17-year-old teenager 
with no battle experience, stand there and says, um, what do I get if I take him out? Isn't that crazy? What kind of fortitude, what kind of inner strength does he have to have to deal and to respond? It was, a, it was like a reflex response. It wasn't like he went away, prayed for a few days, then came back and said, okay, if I do it, what will you give me? No, he was like, it was a reflex response. I'm going to remove this disgrace from Israel. What will be done for me when I do that? David then goes before King Saul and he says, let no one lose heart on, uh, because of this Philistine. I'll, I'll take him on. I'll take him out. Don't let anybody else be scared. He had a humility around him. He went. If you know the story, he kills Goliath. That's 1 Samuel 17. You fast forward to 1 Samuel 30. David by now has a band of soldiers. There's about 600 men that are his men. They've all come to him. The Bible says it's like the army of God growing around David. David's now a tested warrior. He's not only taken Goliath out, he's taken cities out, people out. He's, like, he's really proved who he is. And they've been at a battle. They've come back to their village, Ziglag. They come into Ziglag, and as they're approaching, they see smoke coming up from their city, from their little town. And the Bible tells us that the whole city's been destroyed, burned to the ground. All their families have been stolen, wives and children, all of their possessions taken away. And it says that David and his men wept until they had no more strength left to weep. Okay, so they're, they're upset. Are you with me this morning? I'm, I'm just trying to help you to understand inner strength. And then when they had wept until they had no more strength left to weep, it says that David's men, these are hardy soldiers, they pick up stones and they're talking about stoning David. They're saying it's his fault we lost our families. It's his fault our village has been burned down. And they're going to kill him. And I, I'm interested in David's response again. Here's David's response. He doesn't argue with them. He doesn't say, I'll take one of you on. He doesn't say, I'll take all of you on. He doesn't say, it's not my fault. He, the Bible says this. In 1 Samuel 17, sorry, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, David was greatly distressed. So he's upset about what the men are doing because they're talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter because of his sons and daughters. And then this wonderful phrase, but David found strength in the Lord his God. In the New King James or the King James, it says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. So he's feeling upset. He's shaking on the inside. His emotions are struggling right now. He's been at battle, comes home. His own family have been stolen. The houses have been burned to the ground. His men that he loves, all their stuff's destroyed and their families are gone. They now want to turn on him, greatly distressed. But he's got a secret. David encouraged himself in the Lord. David strengthened himself in the Lord, another translation says. It didn't say David went to church on Sunday to see if somebody could help him. It says David encouraged himself. Who encouraged David? Do you know what it is to encourage yourself? Do you know what it is to strengthen yourself? And I would suggest to you David's strength, both in 1 Samuel 17 as a teenager... And in 1 Samuel 30, as a man who's now coming up to 30 years old, he's 29 maybe, because within a few chapters he's going to be king at 30. So he's still relatively young, but he had learned a secret as a young man that if you want strength on the inside, you go into a secret place with God and you encourage yourself and strength will be imparted to you that is supernatural, divine, God takes up residence, and you can overcome battles that a lot of people would be shrinking back from. I, I, I read those and I say, God, I want that kind of strength. Because sometimes I get upset too quickly. My emotions shake too quickly. 
I sometimes feel like I'm cowardly around some of the issues I'm going to face. I think, have I really got to deal with that? How can I? And I've had to learn over the years, no, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself. in. And the literal translation is lean into God. If you, the literal translation is David leaned into God. I like that. It kind of says, I'm struggling to stand right now. I'm going to lean into you and let you strengthen me today. Uh, one of my heroes in history um, is uh, John Wesley. I'm going to read you a little extract from his journal. Uh, this is John Wesley. Around about 300 years ago, he started the Methodist Church. He was a radical revivalist in the UK. Uh, five decades of revival, planting churches up and down the, the U UK, a crossover in the States, in other parts of Europe. Um, and I have to ask myself, like David, what kind of man has this kind of strength? So listen to this. Sunday morning, May the 5th, preached at St. Anne's and was asked not to come back anymore. That's like finishing here this morning and Lauren says, thanks for coming, but never come back again. I mean, it, yeah. that was May the 5th morning. Sunday, May the 5th evening, preached at St. John's and Deacon said, get out and stay out. Uh, Sunday, May the 12th, maybe better the next Sunday, preached at St. Jude's, can't go back there either. Uh, Sunday, May the 12th, evening service, preached at St. George's, kicked out again. Uh, May the 19th, morning, preached at another church, deacons called a special meeting and said I couldn't return. Uh, evening service, May the 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. May the 26th, preached in a meadow, chased out of meadow as ball was turned loose during the service. The next Sunday, June the 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. I mean, I would probably would have quit after the first Sunday, maybe the second or third Sunday, now being kicked out of the edge of town. That was June the 2nd a.m. June the 2nd p.m., afternoon service, preached in a pasture, 10,000 people came to listen to me. I'm like, wow. Okay, I'm glad you didn't quit. There is something about the fortitude, both in David, in John Wesley. I look at these men and I say, God, I want that kind of strength. Because with lesser battles, I kind of back off too quick. I don't stand as strong as you want me. My, my challenge to us this morning is simply this. God wants you mighty on the inside. He wants you strong in your inner person. He has a well for you to draw from that most people don't have access to if they don't know God. And most Christians in the States are not drawing the water from the wells of salvation to strengthen themselves in what God has for them. Like we have this whole resource of divine help, divine sustenance, divine energy that is mostly left untapped. And it makes us weak on the inside. I believe God wants you stronger on the inside than you are on the outside. He wants you stronger in spirit than you are in your uh, appetites for food or for leisure uh, or, or for financial success. He wants you stronger uh, in your inner person because it will fuel everything else in your life. If you're strong on the inside, it will impact every part of your life. There's a great verse in Jeremiah 6.16, and, and really this is how we get strong on the inside. You can turn to it, and I'll get there in just a moment. Uh, I'll give you one more Wesley quote. John Wesley says, I, when they asked him, why do so many people come to listen to you speak? He said, I set myself on fire, and the world comes to watch me burn. How many know it takes effort to keep a fire going? Fires wane. They kind of go out. A lot of Christians live with fire when they return the first two days after a conference. Some have learned to get their fires stoked maybe on a Sunday. But they don't know what it is to keep the fire burning. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And yet, 
in Leviticus 6, the principle for the Old Testament priests was do not let the fire on the altar go out. Arrange the wood, arrange the sacrifice, keep it burning all the time. It's a picture, Old Testament priest, for New Testament priests. And the Apostle Peter says, we are now priests unto God. We've been translated from one kingdom, brought into another kingdom, and we're now priests. And just like the Old Testament priests had to keep the fire burning, we too have to keep the fire burning. It's our job, but how many know keeping a fire burning takes work? Trees need to be chopped down. I'm not talking about putting your heating on in your home or in your car. I'm talking the old school way. Somebody needs to get some fuel. Somebody needs to arrange it. Somebody needs to keep moving it around, adding stuff to the fire. In our personal daily lives, it's exactly the same. Unless you pay attention to keeping the fire burning every day, it will go out. And the challenge for most of us is that most Christians around us are not keeping their fire burning. And so we don't have great role models. We're not provoked by somebody else's life. And so sometimes we're going to go to Scripture, we're going to go to history to be provoked into what God wants us to do. And Proverbs talking about strength 24 verse 10, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? I I know I should be more pastoral. I want to help you. It's okay. But God is saying, the Proverbs say, if over every little problem you keep stumbling, you're not very strong. You need to get a bit stronger than you are right now. We have a news documentary back home. It's called Hard Talk. I think that was just a bit of hard talk there. If you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? It's time to build up great strength. And I believe this message is prophetic because the Lord is preparing His bride, the church, to be all that He bought at the cross for her to be. I believe that there is coming a convergence of timing where if we are not strong, we will not survive. We cannot be babysat in our churches. We cannot have somebody just making sure we're going to be okay all the time. Now, I believe in community. I believe in gathered church. I believe in attending together. I quote Hebrews where it says, Do not forsake the gathering of the church of the believers as some are in the habit of doing. You have to gather together. But you also have to know how to strengthen yourself in the Lord. How to encourage yourself in God. How to get up off the floor from time to time and reach for divine energy and take a hold of God. In the book of Isaiah, it says, it says something like Isaiah 64 verse 7. And there is no one who stirs themselves up to take a hold of God. Sometimes you've just got to stir yourself up whether you feel like it or not. We live in a culture that only does what it feels like doing. Feels like eating, feels like sleeping, feels like not working on the marriage, feels like not being doing the hard work, feels like not working on the... So we'll just do what we feel like doing because it's all about me and my feelings. The Lord is saying you won't grow strength like that. You've got to grow strength by resistance by pursuit, by disciplines, by implementing things into your life that are going to help you become strong. Now, the, the fruit of it is a free life, a strong life. You won't be blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, but you'll stand steady, anchored into Jesus Christ if you're strong. Your joy levels will stay at a place where they're actually not help, just only helping you, but they're helping everybody around you. When you develop strength, it will permeate from you to the world around you. The fruitfulness of your life, the influence of your life, the joy of your life, the peace of your life. Uh, The enemy held at bay in your life because he knows not to mess with you. Anybody with me? Anybody want that today? To want to live that way and want that in their lives? Proverbs 18, 14, it says, The spirit of a person will sustain that person in sickness. But who can bear a broken spirit? God wants you strong on the inside. He wants you really strong on the inside. That really was me just building up the whole introduction to help you to know you need to be strong on the inside. That you can be. 
Let me read to you from Ephesians 3. I know I've got you in Jeremiah 6.16. I'm going to get there in just a second. Um, Ephesians 3.16-21. to 21. This is a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesus church. I pray, this is an apostolic prayer, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power in your inner being. God wants you strengthened. Paul is saying to the Ephesus church, I'm praying that God will give you strength on the inside by his spirit so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to His power at work in us To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. The Ephesus church were already in revival. They're a powerful group of people. But Paul is still praying for them. I'm praying that God will strengthen you by his spirit in your inner man. Your your inner man, your inner being is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So when I pray that prayer for myself... I say, Lord, strengthen my emotions today. Strengthen my mind today. Strengthen my will today. Release the Holy Spirit, the glorious Spirit of God who lives inside of me. Strengthen me with power on the inside. What am I doing? I'm leaning into the Lord. I'm encouraging myself in God. And I'm telling you, not every day in that moment do I feel strength. But I look a day or two and I look back on my life and I realize, wow, he was sustaining me. Strength was being imparted. It's just like going to the gym. You go in one day, you do some weight training. You're not going to walk out that afternoon or the next day feeling stronger. You're probably going to walk out feeling sore. Anybody know? Yes? You don't go to the gym? No? You got to lean in, but you start developing strength endurance over a period of time. In Jeremiah 6.16, great verse, and normally I just preach this verse for like, I could do a few hours just on this verse. I'm going to give you a taster. You're going to have to take it away and do something with it. He says, the Lord's speaking to the Israelites, and he says to them, he said, "Um, stand, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Doesn't that even just sound exciting? Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. The Israelites, the Lord then said to them, but you would not walk in it. They chose not to. Nobody at Destiny will make that choice. You're all going to say, yes, show me the ancient paths. This is what the Lord says. Who said it? The Lord Lord says it. Stand. I think that's such an important part. I would say to all of us this morning, there's times we've just got to stop. We're so busy. We're walking around everywhere. You've got to just stop. Stand. If you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord, if you're going to take stock of your life, there are moments to stop everything and just stand. Be still. Stop the activity. Stop the problem solving. Stop the complaining. Stop even, just, just stand. And then the Lord says, stand and look. You evaluate. Am I happy where I'm at? If I keep going this direction five years from now, will I be happy where I'm at? With the trajectory of my relationships, my intimacy with God, the strength I'm carrying on the inside, the dreams that he gave me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, Am I happy with the way that I'm responding to the invitation? Every dream, every prophecy is an invitation. Am I happy with it? So you stand, you look, you consider, ponder, you ask. Lord, would you show me the ancient paths? 
and then you walk into it. So there's going to be some action. If you're at crossroads, it means you can keep going straight. You could take a left. You could take a right. Or you might need to turn around and go back. Most of us keep drifting through life without making course adjustments. When we stop, we stand, we look, we ask, we're doing all of that to make sure we're headed the right way, doing the right things. Am I happy with the way I respond to conflict? Am I happy with how much I'm investing into my kids? Am I happy with the way that I'm using my finances right now? Am I happy with the joy levels and the atmosphere in my home? Am I happy with, do I think it's right? Happy may be the wrong word. Am I, it's kind of taking a stock take. Do I think I'm in the right place listening to God? Is my ear sensitive enough to Him? Do I have power, God's power flowing through my life? Do I hear His voice every day? I'm not going to just carry on. I'm not going to carry on just walking. I want to ask the Lord. Lord, is it, is it, show me the, the good way. Show me where I should be walking. Do I need to take a left or a right? Do I need to take a course adjustment? See, you can't do that in one service after hearing this. You're going to have to do this in the coming week. Just to stop. Quieten the noise. Leave the phone to one side. Leave the television off. Get into a quiet space. Or you can do this in community. Sitting with your family or a life group. And just saying, hey, let's not do what we normally do. Let's have a little conversation about are we headed the right way. We heard Pastor Steve say this earlier today or yesterday, wherever, whenever you do this conversation. Hmm, am I headed in the right direction? And then I love what God says, and this is your application. He says, ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the good way and walk in it. Ancient paths. Walk in them. I can't go through all of the ancient paths, but there are old ways to walk in that are very rarely traveled today. Let me give you four without going into detail. The first pathway is consecration. You just say, I'm all in. That's it. Consecration is an old word, but it just means... You take something that's consecrated, you say it's holy, we're going to set it aside, it's special, it's got a special use, it's not everyday use. When we consecrate our lives, we bring them before God and we say, this is your life right now. Whatever you want to do with me, I'm yours. I hold no agenda. Uh, I'm not trying to make a name for myself, I'm not just, I'm not just going through... Whatever it is, you, I think most Christians never come to the point of full surrender. Isn't that sad? They never come to the Lordship of Christ in their lives. Without it, you will always struggle. I've realized that the most difficult part of that journey is actually coming to the point of surrender. The surrender itself is liberating. But actually making up my mind that my money isn't my own, that my words are to glorify Him, that I care nothing for my reputation, and that I'm not after my own ambitions. I lay them all down, and I just say, I'm yours. Whatever you want from me, I'm happy to do. If you want to put me to one side, I'm okay with that. If you want to bring me into the center stage of something you're up to, I'm happy with that. Put me to what you will. Use me how you want. I'm just yours. I can honestly say to you today, standing before you, even with the very nice things Pastor Lauren said about me, I really don't care what people think about me. I'm not fussed about getting onto platforms. I, I am massively concerned that I please Jesus and that I only do what He wants me to do. And here's what I've realized. If I live for the eyes of one man, he can open doors 
that I could never have opened myself. And he can close other doors that will save me a load of grief. So I've learned, or I'm learning, to trust him completely. With my finances, with my family, with my calling in life. I don't have to make my own way. I'm just going to walk closely to him and obey. Could be a little wrap there. Have you ever come and walked the pathway of consecration? In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. It is the most liberating, but sometimes people can take quite a few days to actually come to the point of full surrender. I've learned now, I can't get people to do that in one service. Hey, would you surrender, stand to your feet, and we're going to pray. You're going to have to give it some serious thought. Am I really willing to have Jesus as king? How crazy is that thought? He would want to be my king. He would take me as his son. I'm still blown away by it, that he would love me. Don't get the impression I'm holier than you. I have all the same struggles you do. But I I walk every day in this kind of posture in my heart and often even in practice, and I kneel before him. I say, I thank you so much that you can use me. I feel like the boy's lunch, two loaves, five fish or whatever it was, Five loaves, two fish. Either way, it wasn't a lot. 5,000 people. We're not going to get very far with this. So I look at what I bring to the table and I say, God, it's just like a boy's lunch. But if you'll take it, I'll just give it all to you. He's not looking for gifting today. He's not looking for your performance He just wants you. You get strong by walking with God, but you can never really start walking with God until you come to a place of total surrender. And I I pray at least the journey may start for some today. I'll be honest with you, I, I feel like I've been in this journey for many years. And I kind of give him everything and then I take a few things back. Anybody ever done that? And, and over the last two months, he's been asking for more. But he's really good. So he's not asking for more because he's a mean God. He's like saying, Steve, you don't realize how much I have for you. But I can't get it to you if you keep fighting me. If you want to be in charge, you, you go be in charge. But if you want me to be in charge, you're going to let go. And I, because and I, 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 I'm like, I'm, I want to be in charge of some things. You can be in charge of the things I can't control, but I'm pretty good at this. And, and he's saying, no, I, am I the Lord of everything? But I'm not Lord at all. I won't go into these. The other pathway is the Bible. There's the pathway of prayer. There is a pathway of purity. But I think the Lord just wants us to settle right there on consecration. uh, Joshua 3 and verse 5 it says consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you my home church over the last two months the presence of God has been coming in wave after wave every Sunday, every Friday in our prayer And, and the one thing the Lord keeps asking is put the first commandment in first place And then he said, put the second commandment in second place. I love God, love people. I mean, radical love for God, radical love for people. And then he said to us thirdly, now uh, prioritize the great commission again. So first commandment in first place, second commandment in second place, and make mission a priority, but not letting go of the first two things. I, I still feel I'm still battling with the first one. First commandment in first place. If you don't get that right, everything else kind of goes off kilter. There's a lot of sounds in America. There's a lot of sounds in the American church. You've got huge bookshops. You've got Christian TV. Everybody's on social media telling you how great their church is doing. But there's a fresh wind of the Spirit blowing 
and there's a new thing happening. But the new isn't yet happened. It's about to happen. But God is looking for fully devoted followers by whom he can bring the new sound on the earth. I, I think the invitation is extended to you. You don't have to be like anybody else. The sound you will start to reverberate is also hidden in the hearts of thousands of people in your community. And as you get the sound of consecration and the sound of the King in your presence, suddenly it will awaken in the hearts of other people out there that will think, oh, I never knew I needed church, but I never heard this sound before. It's a sound of devotion, it's a sound of surrender, it's a sound of the King, it's a sound of worship. Worship isn't just some worship. I, I used to think that was worship. Worship is the way that I treat other people. Worship is the way that I embrace the work God's given me. W worship is preferring other people because I know He's watching and I'm worshipping Him with my life. I say, I hope you like this. I hope it smells good to you. I hope it's a sweet aroma. He doesn't just want me to sing on a Sunday, though I believe in some worship. He wants me to worship on a Monday afternoon at work. He wants me to worship when I go to the supermarket, when I open up my checkbook, when I think about how to spend my money. He says, worship me with that. So, Father, I thank you that you're here. You're raising up mighty ones, strong ones. And many of us have known our frailty and our weakness. And I thank you that your desire is to impart strength to us. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. strong. In my weakness, Christ manifests. different things. I, I pray for some of you that the pain that has been in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit I pull out those arrows and darts and I pray for healing. Pray for the oil of the Holy Spirit to begin to flow into the places where there's been disappointment shame, regret, the enemy's voice of condemnation. 
I speak freedom to you right now. Be free. I have a picture of just like oil being poured into an open wound. But it's kind of magical, spiritual, healing oil of the Holy Spirit. And the wound begins to heal up so fast. The arrow pulled out. The oil poured in. And the love of God encompassing you. Healing. Restoration. And Father, I pray the prayer of the Apostle Paul. Would you strengthen the heart, the inner being of every person in this room right now? Every heart that is turned towards you. I speak strength to you right now. Strength in the name of Jesus. Into your mind, your will, and your emotions. I speak strength in the name of Jesus. Supernatural, holy strength. It's going to put steel in your spine. You're going to stand stronger and taller. Your will is going to be stronger to make right decisions. Your emotions are not going to shake like they've been shaking. You're going to know a strength in Jesus' name from today. It's biblical. I'm not trying to hype you up. It's Ephesians 3. Out of His glorious Spirit, He will strengthen you. You'll be rooted by faith in Christ. A new experience of His love. I'm going to hand back to Pastor Lawrence in just a second, but I want to. I, I, I just feel there's going to be some things that you as a church will have to unlearn. I think you're already pretty radical for an American church. But there's some cultural things that have crept in and you don't even see them because you're so close to them. But as you live with a listening ear, he'll help you to do only what he wants to do. So I, I realized over the last nine, ten weeks, we were doing a lot out of habit. And we were doing a lot because all the other churches in the UK do that. And then we started to listen to the voice of the Spirit. And we go, went back to the Bible. And we realized He wanted some things done differently. So unlearning is sometimes as good as learning. Some things that we have to unlearn, some things that we have to learn. Your homework, should you choose to accept it, is to have a few moments of quiet, standing, looking, asking. I've got some books out in the back that will help you to know how to build up your inner man, how to get strong in God. I've got some digital cards there with loads of audio sermons on them. I mean, just have a look out there. I won't plug anything in particular, but I think it can help you to develop that place where you encourage yourself in the Lord. Lean into Him. Amen. Pastor Lawrence.